Hello and welcome to the Bothering Strangers podcast with Max Hearing. I'm Max Hearing, and today my guest is a professional golfer and a professional golf influencer. I guess today's Haley Ostrom. Haley, how are you? I am great. Thanks for having me today. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, great tree in the background, as we know, if you're uh, watching this, by the way. Um, I was telling Haley before, I've never, I didn't see a Christmas tree until I was 20 because. Jew, um, that's why. But uh, anyway, um, you uh, you were you, you are technically a professional golfer, but you were you were golfing on the pro circuit for a while. What was the highest level you reached on the pro circuit? I reached Symmetra Tour status, which is one step below the LPGA. So, how close were you to the LPGA then? I mean, you're one step below, but in terms of strokes um i mean that's hard to like i feel like a lot of people don't realize like how hard it is to compare because it's not like oh this one round i was one stroke away from being on the lpga um because you go to qualifying school for that and it's basically a three tournament circuit where you're competing to get status on the tour so it's three weeks of golf basically. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's kind of hard to just say like, oh, I was this close, but um, yeah, I was on the tour right beneath that. So basically I missed out by, you know, 50 girls, like the fifth, which isn't a lot at no, the end of the not. day, but um, yeah, Q school is just a beast in itself. It's, it's so hard just to go compete there and you have to be on every single week. You can't, you know, have an injury or be sick or whatever, you need to be there and have your A game because everyone else is going to be bringing theirs. I was about to say, I feel like one off day there could could be the end. Oh, 100%. It would definitely be the end of, <laughs> of your professional golf dreams. It, one of my friends, she actually just experienced that this last year. She had three awesome days of golf and her last day she played very mediocre and that was that so <laughs> she packed it up and went home i'm getting stressed just hearing that <laughs> yeah it's intense it's pretty crazy yeah um i i feel like like as a kid i always wanted to be like a basketball player like an nba player and like i, I still you know do sometimes but now looking back, I'm like, I don't think I could take on like the mental side of competing at such a high level. Yeah, it's definitely, especially with golf, I think in particular, it's such a mental sport. But in college, that was something that my coach really just focused on so much. We would have team practices where all we did was work on the mental game. And I think a lot of people don't realize what that takes in professional sports. And just the time that you put in. I mean, I would journal and meditate and visualize every single night of my whole career just in order to get to where I got to, you know? It just, it takes so much. So once you like stopped, you know, competing on the tours, did you feel like a weight was lifted? Um, I would say, yes, it definitely was lifted. I never fully like took myself out of the game. So in my mind, it was like, oh, I'm just not going to play right now. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to compete right now. But there was always this little spark of like, but I could in the future if I wanted to. So I think part of me, that was like for me to just be able to step away, I had to tell myself that I could come back if I wanted to, because otherwise I would get too depressed about it. But it was like a huge weight lifted off because there were so many other things that I was able to go do and expand on my other side of my career and actually be able to make money and keep money and not have to spend it all signing up for tournaments or paying for, you know, my coaching or my training or whatever, I was able to live <laughs> a regular life to some degree 
and make money and, and put it in the bank and not just be spending it every single week, you know, by the thousands of dollars. So it was a big pressure like lifted from my shoulders. And I honestly, I don't really miss most of that. I miss like certain tournaments. I miss certain competitions where I'm such a competitive person, but I still keep myself in so many different competitions and I, you know, I'm still within the golf community. So at the same time, like some of those things I miss, I'm like, well, I still get that in a different version. Right. Uh, you brought up an interesting point about money. Is it like when you're at that level of golf, meaning below LPGA or for men PGA, is it similar to like most tennis players, how they're profession, how, how, they, how they are professional, but they're losing money or barely pulling a profit? 100%. So basically it's not like basketball or baseball or football where you're brought onto a team and you are automatically paid a certain amount. Um, it's, you are your own team and you're funding every part of that. So you have sponsors if you're lucky, but on the mini tours, especially for women, even women on the LPGA, a lot of times you're not making, you're not collecting sponsors like that. You're not, because there's just no benefit to most of those sponsors. You're not going to be on TV nearly as much as the guys. There's not going to be a return on investment or those investors giving money to players, it makes way more sense for them to go invest in the men's um, players because they can actually go win good money and those investors are going to make money back where it doesn't make sense for women. So yeah, it's, um, it's a lot like tennis where you are funding everything. You pay for your entry fee, you pay your travel, airfare, you know, lodging, whatever, food. You pay your caddy, your trainer, your coach, your if you have a nutritionalist, like all of these things, you that comes out of your pocket. So if you don't win a check, that money's just gone. So how many I don't know if you I don't know if you have this knowledge off, off the top of your head, but how like in the LPGA, how many women are like really making good money then i don't know on the lpga you know um i was never around all those girls very often so it wasn't like those are all my friends but i can tell you many tours you know i'm around all those girls i lived that life no one is making any money off of mini tours no one and as for the men as well no one's actually making money you are making money by working another job. So when I was competing, I worked as a beverage cart girl. I did my social media stuff. I worked for another company helping raise money for charity events. They would pay me to come out, help raise money. And so I, I really had like four jobs. I was working, you know, professional golfer and, and then all these other side gigs, you know, it was always like, these were my side hustles, but this was what was keeping me afloat yeah. while I pursued professional golf. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know any of that about you know how much it takes from you unless you're at the top level, you know, really excelling yeah. in the sport. Yeah, definitely. And even when you are, even when you make it to the LPGA, that's the top, the highest level you can yeah. get to, you're still not, you know, the the last quarter of the girls on the lpga they're still like scrambling to get by a lot of those girls and maybe more a lot of those girls are sharing hotel rooms or they're using host families so when they go to tournaments there are families who sign up to host yeah. somebody like they're still doing that they're a professional athlete at the highest level and they have to go stay with host families because they can't afford a hotel room that night you know, it's just they, there's always splitting costs. They drive to a lot of events instead of fly. Like there's a ton of things that that go around trying to play at the highest level when it comes to golf. Yeah, the more I do my research, the more I realize like a lot of American sports, especially for women, are like you don't make money. You more likely than anything lose money. Yeah, and that's that goes to for saying with a lot of 
a lot of sports, you know, at the Olympics, like the people who are competing in the Olympics at the highest level of the world, yeah. like yeah. even they aren't making any money. <laughs> yeah, no, some of them, nothing, or, or, or yeah. you know, very, very little. I should say. I mean, Olympics is interesting because, like, with track, track is like an incredibly popular sport. Yeah, at the, at the Olympics, but nobody in America, at least people, don't watch track in most Olympics. Yeah, well, and even at the Olympics, they walk away with a gold medal. For the U.S., we don't really pay our athletes. They they give them, you know, however much. It's it's really minuscule compared to what they should be making or what their competitors are making in other countries. There are other countries that will pay their athletes if they come yeah. home with a gold medal. They're set for life, pretty much. Yeah. But the U.S kind of like, oh, here's a pat on the back. Here's your medal. <laughs> and you'll probably pick up endorsements, but mm -hmm. that's not actually coming from the country that you're competing for. No, you know? it's, it's Nike, you know, it's Adidas. Yeah, exactly. Right. No, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, just to pivot a little bit here, you were, you were a college golfer, George Fox. It's, mm -hmm. an, uh, it's a D3 though. Yeah. So was that like, were people surprised when you did go take the professional path from a division three school? Oh, I'm sure people were really surprised. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of people didn't. I, I would say not too many people would probably have said that to my face. I did have a yeah. couple friends like that would make comments or whatever. And there's always going to be naysayers everywhere you go. But I think that it was my goal to prove people wrong that D3 athletes still have such great athletes. Like they have athletes who are working even harder than some of the D1 athletes because you're not getting the perks of the D1 colleges and the D1 education. D3 schools, there are so many other classes you have to take. I went to a private uh, private Christian school. I had to take Bible class, which I'm sure a lot of people understand who are in that world. Like they understand what that's like and you have to spend your extra time going to chapel you are required to go to chapel yeah, a certain yeah. amount of times in the semester so just those little things that are taking up you know chunks of your time an hour of your time once a week that that adds up or the course that you have to take whatever it may be you're working so hard in order to keep up with school and play your sport and a lot of, you know, our school in particular, George Fox, we have a really great women's golf program. So I was lucky because, in, which is why I chose the school in the end, was because we got to travel more than any other D3 program. We oh, yeah. were traveling like a D1 program almost every week of the season because we wanted to go play the top schools. So that's why I like I know firsthand I watched us go to nationals every year and compete during the season against D2 teams and D1 teams and beat those teams because we were working so hard. So I knew, you know, the D1 yeah. D3 label is just a label at the end of the day. And there are a lot of good athletes that kind of go under the radar just because they hold the D3 title. That's for sure true uh, i know in basketball and football and sports that are so built on speed and size the the difference between d1 d2 and d3 is each level is like a decrease in in speed and size basically it's not it's not shooting per se some of the best countries shooters in the country for basketball are division three players yeah but it's instead you know you're a little smaller you just you're not as fast is it a similar thing for you know women's golf or men's golf um, I think that golf is a lot different. You don't necessarily have to be big in order to be good. So it's not like a size factor, especially for women, like women that right. really doesn't play a big part. Granted, it might benefit you if you're a bigger girl or a taller girl, you know, you might be able to leverage that, but it's not a huge thing. It's, it really just comes down to when you're going into college where you're at from high school and D one players normally are winning state. They're winning their state championship and, and those girls go wherever they, they want really, they can just go and pick, pick where they want to go. And yeah. they probably have a scholarship waiting for them. So 
not so much, not as much the same as like football or basketball. So was it for you more of a case of you peaked later, a little bit later on? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was a great player in high school in comparison to all the girls I was competing against, you know, but I was growing up, I played against, I played all the sports basically. And it wasn't until later on, it was like, okay, you know, junior year of high school. Well, this is the sport that's going to get me a scholarship. So I should probably just focus on that. And I never too serious about, I was serious enough to be good, but I wasn't like spending all of my time trying to get better. So I went, I I had D1 offers, but they were all like East Coast schools. They were really far away. I had full ride offers to a couple all girls schools, which was kind of funny. My dad was really pushing hard for those all girls Mm -hmm. schools, Mm -hmm. but that was a major no go for me. Um, But I visited a ton of schools in California. I thought I wanted to travel and be somewhere else outside of Oregon. And it just, I didn't ever have the connection with any of those schools. Most of them were all D2. And it was like, I don't know, I'm going to be so far away from home for something like this. I don't know if this is actually worth it. So came back home, decided, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Maybe I'll just go to Oregon and I will try to walk on or Mm. just not play golf. But my dad had mentioned George Fox and I was very much not interested until I went and visited and I just fell in love with it. I loved the coach. I loved the team. You know, the school was really nice and small and it just seemed like the right fit for me. And yeah, I would say once I got there and realized like what I could have if I made the top five lineup, I worked my butt off in order to to achieve that because I wanted to be able to travel. Yeah, top five. It's like if you're not in the top five, you're not competing, right? Yeah, so top five, you compete for your team. And then you can have – most tournaments will allow you to have, like, one individual player. So they will just play. They could – technically win the tournament as you know an individual unlikely because they're usually outside of the lineup for a reason they're not good enough to make the lineup that week so you can have them it's kind of like to help other girls like freshman girls like get a feel for the tournament see what it's going to be like and you know it's kind of like your b player you know every once in a while if you're winning a basketball game by a lot you put in your b team oh. get some to get some like play time that's kind of what it's like so my coach really believed in spending the money to bring the sixth player along so my freshman year i actually got to travel the whole year because i ended up being the sixth player but i watched my team at nationals i watched the championship just fade away, slip away. And I said right then and there, I will never be outside of the lineup again because I knew I was good enough to compete. And I watched the pressure get to some of my teammates. And I was like, I will never allow this to happen outside of my hands. Like I wanted to be in control of whether or not we were going to win a national championship or if I was going to win a tournament in general, I wanted to be in charge of that. So that's when I kind of like worked really hard that summer in order to make the lineup. And I came back my sophomore year and I ended up competing in our team's um, placements. I qualified for the number one spot. So I went from six to one one the following season. But what what happened your senior year? Because your senior year, you won four tournaments. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I, once I realized how much I could improve from freshman year to sophomore year, I got most improved, I believe every season. I think I maybe just not once, maybe I didn't get it from sophomore to junior, but, um, I just realized like I was putting in so much extra time. I would show up first one to practice first one or last one to leave. So I would get there like an hour before practice or I would leave an hour after practice ended, whatever it was, all those little, those, that time, it just started to add up. And 
it makes a big difference in the end. It's like you're putting in all this time. You might not see the improvement right away, but in the end you're going to, you know, one day you'll see the the improvement. It'll pay off. It's actually one of the things my team, we always talked about this book about the growing bamboo. And it's like you water, if anyone has a bamboo plant, you know, you water and water and water and it just doesn't grow. And then one day it just shoots up out of nowhere and it's this huge bamboo. And that's like your golf game. You practice and practice, and practice. You might not see the improvement right away, but it'll pay off. And one day it just clicks for you. So I think um, it, it clicked for me. My senior year, I had the most confidence at tournaments. I had worked on my mental game so much to the point where, I mean, I could recite mental like, like uh, quotes from books. And like, I, I just would show up to tournaments with the mindset that everyone else was competing for second. And if I played the game, I knew how to play. Everyone else was competing for second. So all I had to do was show up and, and play and take it one shot at a time. And it would happen for me. It was really just about staying in the present moment and one shot at a time and just allow it to happen itself. Was there, I, I love that uh, mental philosophy and I, I think I need it in my life because uh, <laughs> things keep slipping away a little too easy sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but was there a point in college you're like, I'm going to, go pro or at least try to go pro yeah it was my senior year my dad kind of started putting that idea in my head like you know you're good enough you should go compete down on some mini tours you know in california or in arizona or florida and and i think that also played a huge factor in my game my senior year was to i, I watched a lot of girls get to their senior season and the pressure of like oh this is it this is it you know, I want to do really well because this is, I'm almost done with this. I'm almost done with my, my golf career. And the pressure gets to them so much that it becomes almost emotional and they just completely bomb out of their senior year. So I think the fact that I went into senior year kind of thinking, you know, I, I think I will go compete on some of the mini tours. And I think I will try and continue to improve because the scores I saw in mini tour tournaments, I was like, yeah, I could shoot that. Like, I would love yeah. to do that. Why not go try? So I didn't ever allow myself to think this is the end of it. And that really, again, just helped me stay in the moment. And I didn't have to worry about, oh, this is my last tournament. This is my last time playing for my team or anything. Cause I was still looking for, for the future. I was looking forward to what was to come. So what changed when you went probably obviously the level of difficulty is like, you know, a good bit higher, but were you, were you practicing the same mental, did, what, what, what changed in regards to your process? From college to professional golf? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the main difference on paper is that the tournaments are usually a little bit longer uh, or the. I should say the tournament is longer, but the, the courses are longer. So automatically you're playing longer courses, which should in turn be a little more difficult. I think the biggest part for me that was so hard was that my college coach prepared us for the top competition. She prepared us for the LPGA, really. I mean, she made everything very official and our tournaments were ran very official. There were certain rules you follow and etiquette and all these things. It was just top of the line, you know, the best tournament, the tournaments that I ever played in. When I came to Arizona, I started playing in like cactus tour events and, and mini tours. They weren't the same. They were so like low key and very like not ran very professionally and so i walk up to the first tee at my first event there's music playing there's you know the guy running it he holds his microphone and he's like and on the number one tee and it's kind of a joke so i was shocked and girls were on the course like pulling their phones out just texting like they never no one seemed to really take it yeah. that seriously where I took it very, very seriously and was like, you know, trying to 
do what I did in college. So it was a very big mental change for me to be like, okay, like maybe don't take it so seriously or don't get upset that these people are not taking it seriously, that they're breaking rules technically by pulling their phones out or whatever. I just had to kind of transition my mind a little bit. Um, and just the difference of playing golf in Oregon and a lot of places with that type of weather and courses, I was transitioning to Arizona, which is straight desert golf. Um, it's just a different style, different grass. Everything's a little bit different. Just kind of learning the vibes of that. Yeah. I'm really surprised here, but like the, uh, unprofessionalism. Yeah. And it's not true across the board for all mini tours. Sure, sure. Um, WAPT is a great tour for women. It travels more. So it was harder for me to go play cause it requires more money. Um, but for the most part, the tours that are available for women, there's only a few. They're very unprofessional and just, it's just like a, a side gig for some people. Like it's, it's weird. It's a totally different than anything you would ever think of for professional sports. So I guess this, this actually leads very well into this question. Um, I'm sure you are familiar, you watch PGA and you're familiar with the men's side of the game as well. What are the big, like, glaring issues that, like, all, besides the money, because the money is, like, the obvious one, what are the big glaring issues from, like, men's pro tours to women's pro tours? Um, I would say money kind of, like, everything kind of stems from that. So, you know, events, like, what courses are the women playing versus the men and what conditions are they in? I have not personally uh, attended women's events that haven't been in good shape, but I have heard t countless of times where a women's tournament is at a course and it, the course wasn't ready. It was unprepared. It was a dog track. It just sucked. And men's tournaments will never be like that. The course might be set up really hard and you might hear guys complaining a lot about it, but it is so far from what the women yeah. have to deal with that it's kind of funny sometimes when i hear people complain on the men's tours and i'm like you have no idea yeah. like some of the courses that we have to play um so and that's a money thing a sponsor thing so sponsorships for the women's tour just as a tour as a whole usually not as much uh funding there so again that goes back to money and where's the money coming from major major problem is that the women's tour is not shown on air nearly as much as men's and that's because they're not getting the viewership so why would they spend money to play the women's tournament yeah. when they're not going to get the views it's unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. And I don't blame any of these networks for not showing a women's tournament if they're not going to get viewership. So I think that that goes on to women and that's our job, like as golfers, make it interesting. There are a lot of characters on the men's tour yeah. that oh, yeah. there's, there's characters, there's drama. There's always drama on the men's tour. There's always someone saying something or somebody like Max Homa, who wasn't that popular by any means, but he went on social media and kind of became a social media sensation, yeah. funny, and and got this little fan base. And now he's one of the most popular guys on tour, and he's not out there winning tournaments every week, but he's funny. So the women need to do, I think, what someone like Max or even myself doing social media is can do all these women can do it yeah, anybody sure. on tour can do it most guys want to watch the day in the life of what professional golfers are, yeah. are going through so if if you know alexi thompson or somebody like that was willing to showcase their day-to-day -day life what they're doing how they're prepping for tournaments whatever they will 100 percent get more views i believe on tv each week at their tournaments i think that's a huge issue right now for women's golf it, that seems like a similar an issue for women's sports. Like, like mm -hmm. I've heard the same thing, but I, I also feel like, like myself and many people, like there is an admiration and fascination with athletes 
of both genders at the top level because to just to mm -hmm. make it right requires something else like a different you know mental level yeah to hit, to hit the top level of, of a sport whatever sport it may be and i think that in itself like you know people are interested is is the short of it yeah and i would say also you know people have said well the girls aren't as good it's not as fun to watch them because they're not as good it's not the same and that's sport, just though. simply it's just untrue like if you look at scores on the same courses a lot of the times women are actually shooting better scores and people don't want they don't think that that's true or they don't want to believe it yeah. or they make the excuse of oh well they get to play a shorter course it's like okay well compare it to the average golfer like women are still playing much longer courses than the average male golfer would yeah, play. Sure. They're hitting the ball further than the average male golfer, but their game is more strategic and more relatable to the average golfer than the guys on the PGA tour. Yeah, I totally absolutely. understand why people like watching the men on the PGA tour bomb the ball 400 yards or whatever, course, yeah. because that's exciting and that's crazy. And it's like never been done before and whatever, but the women are still like hitting miraculous shots and holding out from the fairway and hitting hole in ones. And, and it's honestly like, I think it's pretty fun to watch the women, but it's hard when you can't like relate to these people. There's not a lot of Americans on the LPGA tour who are yeah, in the top that. of the field every week. So it's hard to grow a fan base around that when the characters that you could create aren't, you know, they're not playing as well yeah. or, or they're not even making a name for themselves to begin with. So, yeah, it's all related. Yeah, they, they need to do a reality show like what F1 did. Honestly, I think that would be a, a lot of sports could use it. A lot of a lot of because the effect on F1 solely from as an American production, it took a sport that nobody knew about in America and said, and mm -hmm. now there are two races a year in two different places. Yeah. There's going to be an American racer next year for the first time in like 20 years. Like, <laughs> but people crazy. care. <laughs> people care. Americans care. So there's an American, yeah. right? Like, it's. Yeah, it's just somebody to root for. You feel like you're. I, I always say this with my journey through social media is I think a lot of people started following me initially because they wanted to see if I could make it. My goal was to make it yeah, on the tour. Sure. And so they wanted to follow along and be a part of that journey. Because I was willing to share every single second of it. I shared my losses way more than I ever shared my victories. Because it was like they can relate to that and they were supporting that. And I think people want to feel involved even in the small, like smallest degree and feel like they impacted you or they helped you or they supported you through the tough times until you eventually make it or you don't. So yeah, that's. I think that's the F one. That's like a perfect, per perfect, idea. perfect example. Yeah. It's, yeah, they should be doing that for women. Honestly, there'd be drama because yes, the women yes, on TV. There there's would. gonna be drama. Like it would be great. I would watch it. I don't know if you saw. I just recently saw a podcast clip of uh, Kelsey Plum. I don't know if you know her. She's a WNBA player, and like mm -hmm. she competed at the Olympics and three on three. She's she's a top player, and she was like, and she's like, they have to do mic'd up for and for female players because they say the meanest like they get super <laughs> personal like it's way worse than like men's basket like the nba and she's like if they did yeah. that the the sport would and like you know pushed it out there oh boy like i can't imagine the effect it would have <laughs> yeah i mean everybody people say they don't like drama they don't <laughs> want like reality that's why they like f1 whatever. that's why they like but this show yeah, I'm like at the end of the day, like you do like reality TV. You do like some of the drama because that's why everybody, that's why some of the top TV shows are reality TV yeah. shows. That's yeah, why sure. people, even with sports, I never have understood why men, sorry, all the men, but I've never <laughs> understood why men watch all these shows or listen to these stations that just talk about like, who do we think is going to be chosen for the these these games or who do we think is going to play or who's trading who 
And I'm yeah. like, who cares? Why are we talking about it? Like, why don't you just wait a week and you'll find out? Like, everyone's like talking about what's gonna happen and is this coach gonna stay? And, yeah, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. there was a big drama. This coach mm-hmm. was cheating on his wife. No one knows the wife, but it's somehow like on ESPN because mm-hmm. it's drama. So drama. everybody like a little bit of drama and a little bit of reality. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that that is the reason the F1, I mean, other than the Netflix budget, of course. Of course. The, the reason F1, the show, did so well so quickly was because it's a, it's a sport filled with drama, mm-hmm. and they just showcased it. Like, it was nothing grand. They're just like, let's show people the drama, you know? And yeah. like, yes, we like the drama, and then... I think that's why they like, you know, NBA off season and like the trade rumors, the trade mill. Exactly. I don't, I've never understood that because I just don't care, but I'm like, I'm guilty of it. I'm I'm guilty. I'm guilty of it. I'm, I'm a sports writer too. And I I am a sports writer by trade, but I'm, I'm guilty of, of everything you just said. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, if everyone just waits one more week, we're going to know. We don't have to sit here for hours. Instant gratification. Instant gratification. I need, I need it now yeah <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to know who's going where no yeah. but you're right you're you're right you're right i i think especially in in more it's solely really in regards to team sports it's like men men yes we gotta know we need to know what's what's happening or we need to know what might happen more importantly yeah <laughs> like, there, there also is i feel like there's a level of pride in being like the first you're with your friends and you're the first one to find out this trade app and like, whoa this person got traded and then it's like it's you <laughs> um yeah i mean i'll take your word for it yeah no, you're gonna that have exciting to. <laughs> you're, 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 you're gonna have to because 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 if you wait one more minute you're not going to be the one to know this so, <laughs> that's why but um no i get i get that with everything just drama got you got to showcase the drama yeah for, for, for sure. sure um let's talk about your just real quick we talked about this a little bit before like, but your move kind of away from the tr- the mini toys you were doing and into more just like into golf influencing more but like more specifically into golf influencing. was that was that a tough transition for you or very did it come kind of naturally at that point so I was already, when I moved to Arizona, one of my friends, he suggested I start turning my social media into more of a golf social media. And he basically had told me like, you know, this is a good way to find sponsors. I know a couple of girls down here who are doing this. Mm-hmm. It was really early in that kind of world. Sure influencers existed but as far as like golf was concerned there weren't a bunch of golf youtubers there was only a few and that just shows how quickly this world like yeah. mm-hmm. became something but i didn't think that it would be anything and i'm like no one's gonna want to watch me swing a golf club and Mm-mm. I actually made a bet with him because he said, if you follow like these things if you follow the hashtags and you do this and you do this all these things for two weeks by the end of two weeks you'll have a thousand new instagram followers and i was like what no way like i only have a thousand instagram followers you're saying i'm gonna double it well by the end of two days i had a thousand new instagram followers by the end of two weeks i had like like three or five thousand new instagram followers it happened so fast and from there it was just a gradual growth by like a year, I think I had reached maybe like 60,000. I don't really remember, honestly, maybe 70,000. That's when the golf channel shows started happening. They pull, they called me for shot makers and they called me for driver versus driver. That really like kind of just kicked everything up yeah. a notch. So by the time... I made the decision to stop competing. That was during COVID. There were no tournaments going on, really. There wasn't much. I wasn't, all my work stuff had been canceled. I had been doing social media gigs where I would get paid to come out and do this or whatever, but it was really mellow. I was doing it on my own. Um, Nothing big. I didn't have like huge long term partners. I had Nike for a while, but it wasn't like a huge paycheck kind of thing. It was really small 
um, great partnership, but yeah, <laughs> not get, not for getting paid. So yeah. I, yeah, sure. I got a call from WME, which is an agency and yeah. huge, a huge agency, just big agency. For everyone to know. I had been called before by agents and I was never, I never liked their answers to any of my questions. I never understood how anyone was going to pitch me better than I could pitch me. And I, whenever I asked them, you know, how are you going to do this? Like, how will you pitch me? I just didn't like their answers. I was totally against having an agent because I was doing it on my own. I thought I was doing a great job. This agent, for some reason, I just liked what he had to say. And I liked what he, he, he was just like a no bullshit kind of guy and yeah. was straight to the point. And we instantly, you know, got along. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll give him a shot. And from that moment, he already had all the connections with WME that he just, he, here's this partnership, here's this partnership, here's this. Like, what do you want? And I'm like, well, okay. And I've always been somebody, I don't just take every sponsorship that comes my way. I'm very strategic about who I, who I pick, who I want to work with. It has to be organic, you know, otherwise it's, it's just fake. It's not authentic. It's not who I am. I don't want to be a part of partnerships that I have no interest in. So, um, I started working with him and COVID canceled everything on TV, pretty much all sporting events. It canceled all the gigs I had lined up. So I had to get creative and I figured all those people who are sitting at home, you know, there's not a lot to watch on TV now. Maybe they'll just go to social media. They're all going to be sitting on their phones all day. TikTok is huge. You know, it's kicking off and all these people on their phones, like I should just be pushing my page as much as possible. So I got creative on what I was posting. I just started posting random content of like me doing stuff at home in the house, little trick shots. You can't really like go out and do anything. So I was like, okay, well, here's this, here's this. I'm going to chip this ball into this cup or whatever, random stuff. Yeah. And it just, it really like kicked off. And um, that's when all these brands wanted to pay for their advertisement on my page because their advertisement on TV wasn't going to be bringing in the viewership that it was supposed to. So my agent, he helped me so much. And I can't believe that I was so against having an agent. Looking back, I'm like, wow, I I did a great job on my own. But it's ridiculous, like, how much an agent really does help. And I mm -hmm. was so against it for so long. Yeah, the right agent matters. And just so everyone knows, Haley has 462,000 Instagram followers now. So <laughs> blew up. Safe to say, blew up. I'm still working on my TikTok. TikTok's a lot harder, but lately I've been like on there every day trying to come up with something to post. Yeah. Keeping the the Gen Zs. Oh, <laughs> uh, they're hard. As somebody who's technically in Gen Z, just the back end of it. But uh, I, don't, I <laughs> honestly, I don't understand TikTok. It's one of those things that's like everyone's like, oh, you got to do TikTok. So I put like, I don't put a lot of stuff, but I'll put the same videos on TikTok and Instagram, right? And it's always just better on Instagram. You can't put the same things on both because the audience is so much different. So I'm I'm much better on Instagram, but I try to change my mindset when I go to TikTok and I, I think of more like clever, what I think is funny ideas that would bomb on Instagram. It would not do well at all, but it works on TikTok. But I'm a millennial, so I'm like... All everybody on TikTok that's Gen Z makes fun of all the TikTok millennials. You're barely, because, you're barely millennial though. Yeah, I'm like almost the cutoff for yeah. it. Yeah, so it's like uh, it, you're. <laughs> yeah, you say you say millennial. You're not a millennial like the way. You're no, like, like the way people think of millennial. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in my 30s. I was born in 94, yeah. so I'm 28. But my brother is three years younger than me, and he's that's a Gen millennial. Z. He's oh, sorry. Z, sorry, younger, so, younger. Yeah, yeah, younger. younger. I, yeah. I'm, the same, I'm the same age as your brother, so we are both technically Gen Z. Yeah, I'm sure we both yeah. don't feel like we're in Gen Z. He feels like he's he should be a part of either one. Like he's totally in the middle. That's the, that's the way it is. The people born like 95 and 99. Yeah, you're you're kind of in both. So <laughs> yeah. 2000s the cutoff though. Mm, hear, yeah, pretty if much. I hear 2000. I'm like, oh. God, baby. It just it just feels young. It just feels young. And it's 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 not like for me, it's only three years younger. Like that's really not that young to me, but it just feels yeah. very young. And I'm like, 
Nah, mm-hmm. nah, 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 nah. I'm like, you don't even know what the 90s was about. As I, I, I do. don't even know the 90s was about. No, exactly. I'm like, I was born in 94, so, like, do I really know what the yeah. 90s was you, about? You, like, you, you, you might know mm-hmm. what 99 was about. Yeah. Ca- caught I might, a glimpse of I might have some memories of it, but... <laughs> Yeah, the only ones who know the '90s were about were the ones born in the '80s. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're we are we are no better. We're no the exact same. No. But yeah, I I don't Gen Z. I mean, it it just seems it just needs to be quick. Basically, you know, everything just needs to be fast to catch their eyes. Yeah, for sure. I and that's that's how it is on TikTok. It's like a whole different ball game as far as making your videos like you can't have these long drawn out videos they want you yeah. know seven seconds and mm-hmm. within the first one second it has to catch your attention and you, got, and you got to be changing Next. shots a lot too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No. it's true it's true I, I i i do stand up so i i like post i just posted a clip on there recently nothing <laughs> like i post like pizza reviews because i look like dave portnoy especially like the side profile is like spot on <laughs> Instagram, I got like the algorithm picks it up sometimes. Never, nothing has come of it on TikTok. Yeah, it's tough, but all it takes is one. All, I know, know, I know. My... That's that's why I'm hopeful. That's why I'm hopeful right there, you know? Yeah. Or the videos I think are just tanking. Like a week later, all of a sudden it will just do so well and blow Crazy. up. And I'm like, I'm like, wait, that w- I almost deleted that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, yeah. th- th- this almost didn't exist. Here yeah, I almost was never... like, this is embarrassing how bad it's doing. Amazing. Yeah, I need to delete it and then i don't because i'm not that lame but i'm like oh, wow, i'm glad i didn't delete it <laughs> just shows you that nobody understands the algorithm no and it's always changing so literally no one actually understands the algorithm yeah right i think the thing in the, with tiktok is weird to me is like i i don't know if i'm a bit like gary vaynerchuk guy mm-hmm. and he's always been like you gotta get on tiktok because like they don't have a lot of content now you put it on you put it on tiktok Eventually, there's going to be a lot of content, and the algorithm won't push it. The algorithm still seems to be pushing everybody. So, like, well, whoever they choose, at least. Like, I don't. Is there a point when TikTok is going to reach enough content, or is this, or is it just like fake? You know? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. No, it's no. It's just like something to think about. It's not like uh, you know. It's just like. Yeah, I don't on? actually have the answer for you there, yeah. but yeah, no, it is weird. Like, it's just a whole different universe. <laughs> yeah, nuts. Yeah, it, I don't know. It is what it is. I guess it's it, it's just just a necessary part of social media at this point. Yeah, necessary evil. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I know we're in the last couple minutes here, so I always end with uh, one question. So you're not the first person here, and you will not be the last. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received, and what is the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, that is so on the spot. Best. <laughs> piece of advice i feel like i heard something recently that i like really loved but obviously if i can't think about it right now then it couldn't have been that great um i would say something that always has stuck by me i don't know if it's really advice but it was just about like living in the moment and in the present and just keeping things in perspective um this was this again goes back to like my senior year of college just learning like how to stay in the moment but just keeping things in perspective always because you never know what someone else is going through and at the end of the day like your problem in your life whatever it is that day if you are driving and somebody cuts you off like that's so small in comparison to what other people might be going through at the moment like someone might have just discovered that they're diagnosed with cancer or they might have just lost a loved one like there's just so many bad things in this world that for the most part most of the bad things in your life or the bad days or whatever are so small so don't let those little moments you know affect affect the outcome of your day um I truly try to live by that. Sometimes I get really into a funk and I forget about it. But Mm -hmm. for the most part, I think I took that with me into the golf space. And when I was competing, I would always carry that. And that helped me play a lot better. But it's something that everybody can do in their day-to-day life, obviously. The worst piece of advice, I had a lot of people 
tell me like, you know, not to go certain places. Like, don't move to Arizona. Why don't you move to California instead and play there? And I can tell you that I've made some really great decisions in my life that I was just thinking about it today on my my run this morning. I was like, man, some of these things that I decided going to George Fox University was never at the top of my list, never even on my radar, didn't know it existed. And I somehow ended up there. And I'm just so blessed that I did because it led me to play golf longer and improve so much and make these relationships that I decided I wanted to keep competing. And then when I wanted to move to Arizona, you know, there was a lot of people who told me to go to California instead. Why don't you go to Palm Springs? Go down there. It's nicer, you know, whatever. And for whatever reason, the door just opened for me to go to Arizona. And that was, again, the best decision I could have ever made. The people I've met, the career I've created being here, I know I wouldn't have had if I went to California, if I moved to Palm Springs or to Florida or wherever else I was looking at. So I think the I've just been given like little pieces of advice. It doesn't really relate to everybody else out there, but I guess um, advice then from that would just be like, like go with your gut at yeah. all times because there's going to be factors in your life and there's going to be voices of people just telling you to go one way or go the other. But at the end of the day, like the right door is going to open and take that as a sign. If that's what feels right, like just go for it and take the leap of faith and everything will work out in the end. It's kind of like that. Just like, it's like a trust your gut, you know? Yeah, definitely trust your gut. I mean, I can't, I actually did decided on California at one point. I said, I'm going to Palm Springs. I'm listening to, you know, the outside voices. I'm going to Palm Springs. And it was like the next day, something major just opened for me. And I was like, oh shit. No, actually I'm going to Arizona. Like <laughs> yeah. that, I know that that's the right decision. I never looked back. So trust your gut. Yeah, trust your gut. I agree with that. Oh, that's a great place to end this episode. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Of course, I hope I asked you other than you know, other than the last question. I hope they weren't all too too on the spot. <laughs> no, it was mellow. Okay, good, good. I'm glad. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming on. Thank you for watching. Uh, this episode will be on available on YouTube, all the podcast platforms, basically anywhere you can get it. And um, yeah, have a good day, everyone.